example. Good afternoon, everyone. So I heard a lot of questions about side channels, timing channels, and this talk, as you see the title, it will be talk. Of, it will be about side channels. So great that we have some audience for it. Um, I'm going to talk about hardware security. Basically, if you see nowadays, we have many different hardware devices. For example, in the cloud, we have CPU, GPU, FPGAs, and ASICs. And we also have a lot of personal devices like smart watches, mobile devices, and uh, smart home devices. And uh, on top of all these devices, we are running privacy sensitive applications. For example, at this moment, your laptop or mobile devices are processing your personal mess messages. And maybe your smart home cameras are taking videos of what is happening at your home. So with all these privacy sensitive applications, it's definitely very important to secure our system. And this slide will echo what Srini have talked about, uh, trust computing base. Basically, if we view our system, I usually view it as three layers. Of course, you can divide even further thinner layers, but usually I view it as three layers. On top, you have software applications such as your browser, your bank applications, etc. And it runs on top of an operating system or hypervisor. And eventually, it needs to run on a piece of silicon, which is the hardware. And usually, the upper layer needs to trust the layer beneath it. That's we make hardware the part of the trust computing base. So basically, if you have all your applications fully verified using Adam's magic tool, you still need to make sure your hardware is secure to ensure the whole system running, not leak your secret or do not tamper the integrity, etc. But unfortunately, as we already seen a bit from the questions, we are entering the age of pervasive hardware tags. So here is an abstract view of our processor. We have some on-chip uh, stuff and off-chip DRAM. On-chip, we have cores, computation units, caches for fast storage access, and almost Every microarchitecture structures have been exploited by leaking data or uh, tamper the integrity of a system, such as using SPECT and Maldon. Those are the famous ones. And we also have row hammer attacks, which just uh, randomly flip the bits in your DRAM. And with all these threats and the challenges, security threats, what shall we do? Uh, in our group, we are trying to uh, design systems using principal approaches. And uh, in my group, we kind of address this problem along two uh, uh, following two research dimensions. First is that we are conducting some offensive security research. So it's kind of essential for hardware security uh, researchers to conduct some offensive security research. The reason is, unlike software, mostly we are embracing the open source world, hardware is rarely open sourced. And all the processors you have seen, Intel and AMD, all these processors, they are closed sourced. They are like a black box. You actually rarely know what exactly any bugs or vulnerabilities inside. So therefore, for the offensive security research in our group, we are trying to reverse engineer some dirty details there and trying to figure out whether there's new threat models or new vulnerabilities we should take a look into. Uh, for example, just give you a bit uh, a taste of what kind of research we are doing. Two years ago, uh, we discovered this Pac-Man attack. Pac-Man attack is basically an attack that exploit vulnerabilities present in the Apple M1 chip. So basically, Apple M1, it got to the market and got such a big popularity. And Apple M1 is super secure in the sense that it, in, it uses ARM's latest uh, security feature called pointer authentication to protect the program not being tampered with by attackers. But we show that attacker can use side channels to bypass this layer of protection. And we demonstrate proof of concept attacks on Apple and one processors. And they acknowledge our attack indeed work. So this is another, uh, basically, it alerts the community that, OK, you should also think about potential vulnerabilities when you put up together new security features. On the other hand, we also conducted defensive security research. Of course, we are benign people. We are trying to make our system more secure. And uh, this is what I, we, I have been doing since my PhD. And uh, today, I will just focus on one piece of work, which is Pensive, a modular approach for security evaluation of microarchitectural designs. designs. Uh, this is a piece of work in collaboration with my PhD student, Yu Heng Yang. Uh, Toma, a PhD student, uh, used to be a PhD student here at MIT, and now he is a faculty at EPFL. And uh, Stella, who is a PhD student co uh, advised by uh, Professor Alan Chabala. So in this work, we focus on how can we know 
our design is secure in terms of dealing with a specific security attack called Spectre, Spectre Execution Attacks. So basically, Spectre, Meltdown, they were on the headlines, headlines in 2018. People think it is maybe the worst ever CPU box because it affects almost all the CPU processors on the market as long as it's an advanced processor, not like super slow 20 years ago produced processor. And uh, uh, anything you want to fix it, will, uh, any uh, reasonable fix or complete, complete fix will introduce serious performance overhead. And even worse, this attack can ignore a lot of security features you put in the software layer. Basically, it can across the kernel user privilege boundaries and allow attacker to dump all the kernel data. It can also bypass the process isolation boundary to allow one attacker process to dump the password used in another process. And even worse, it leaves no traces. So this comes back to Vinod's question, whether we know there's Spectre meltdown happened in the wild. The answer is, even if it happens, we do not know because no commercial system now can detect such kind of attacks because they actually happened at microarchitecture level. So they do not leave any system logs. Uh, what scared people more is that Spectre meltdown is not even a bug because it is actually a performance feature where computer architects put into the processor 20 years ago. And this feature was even written in our textbooks to teach computer architectures, uh, future generation of computer architectures, how to design our processors in a more, much more efficient and high performance way. So because it's not a bug, you may wonder, so, so what exactly it is? At a very high level, when you are write a program and you want to run this program on piece of hardware, you assume it will just run code as commanded by you. But in reality, when you run this piece of code on a real chip, the chip will try to optimize the performance of your program by predict some code because the chip thought you may run this code. Therefore, it tried to predict running this code ahead of time so that your program can finish faster. But this prediction can be incorrect. So sometimes the process just to run some code is not specified in your program. And usually it is a benign behavior, but if it's got controlled by an attacker, the attacker will just uh, uh, command the processor run some unintended instructions. And these unintended instructions will leave some side effects in the system. I mean, these side effects usually make your system run faster or slower. And just this timing information is sufficient enough to leak a lot of secret stuff like passwords, etc. That's why usually people call it the timing side channels. And what we are trying to look into is we are in this cat and mouse game of, the, of mitigating speculative execution attacks. So basically, when Spectre come out in 2018, and 2019, uh, because it's such a serious security threat, so a lot of researchers in the community, including my home community and the security community, were trying to figure out how can we mitigate these attacks. So a batch of mitigations have been proposed, including my own work in this spec on the, on the slide. But very soon, within less than a year, some other, or maybe including the group of researchers who propose these defenses, they find out these defenses are not secure because they find a variant of attacks named Spectre Rewind or Speculative Interference Attack that can bypass these defenses. And the game just goes on because in 2021, a researcher comes up and said, okay, if I know how the attack variant works, I also know how to patch it. So they proposed Ghost Minion, just a name for another advanced defenses. Now, as we go through this process, the defense mechanism just become more and more complex, which makes reasoning about security even more challenging. And it is really a question when we start the project Pensive, we were really curious whether Ghost Minion is secure or not, because it just has so many moving pieces. And once you make a system complex, it just very likely there's a bug uh, when it comes to implementation. And second, you, you, you really need to wrap your brain around to really understand and think about all the corner cases. But the problem is that we actually, the community, have not known what is the good way to evaluate security, to perform security evaluation for side channels. So what we were actually doing right now was using rather weak approaches. This approach involves two steps. In step one, we get the defense proposal and we implement it in a 
uh, like simulator and the community widely used Gen5 as a simulator. And the Gen5 is a performance oriented simulator for people to get an estimation about, okay, if I propose some new design, what will be the performance estimation or area, uh, you know, or a power consumption estimation of it. And then what the evaluation looks like is we run our st original spectra tag on this Gen5 simulator. And then if we see a tag doesn't work anymore, then we say it's great. Of course, if it still works, then we are in bigger trouble. Of course, if you just run the spectra tag, it's not sufficient. So usually there's a step two follows with this. And in step two, we are trying to reason the defense mechanism we come up with works for all possible attack variations. Now, just to look at the words, all possible attack variations, sounds like we need to do an exhaustive search of something. Uh, the problem is that we actually cannot do it in a very automatic fashion. And uh, rather than doing automatic or more smarter tracks, we just leverage human efforts. So most likely, we allow, ask our PhD students or their professors and or even engineers in the company to just drink a lot of coffee and they're trying to figure out whether we can we, we forgot some corner cases or not, whether we can devise another co corner cases for us to validate our thought. And this is not really a trustworthy approach to do that, because who knows whether we are exhaustive enough or not. And, uh, just follow the spirit of this session, it would be better to a security, we are better to do a security proof. Uh, but we know that security proofs are very challenging, so we are tackling the first step. At least we want to do automatic bug finding. We can automatically reason about whether there exists a bug or not. So uh, that's why, as a computer architect, we are, I'm trying to consult researchers from the formal methods community. Turns out that there is a lot of tools, a, a lot of automated reasoning tools, or even manual theorem proving tools. Uh, all these tools are existing, and they are very powerful. But there exists a big gap between the computer architecture community and the verification, uh, formal verification technique uh, community, because we can just not directly apply these techniques to our problem. The key problem is that we even do not have a clear description of our defense because most of our defenses were described in human language. And human language have, all, uh, have this unavoidable vagueness. Or alternatively, you may want to put stuff into action. You have this high level idea and you really want to implement it, so you put it in RTL. But usually hardware design implementation, it just uh, takes way more engineering effort you can think of. Like the, the engineering effort you should count by years rather than maybe months or weeks. So we really want to find problems in the early stage of our design. We want to find problems in the defense idea before we go uh, and we gain confidence in our design. Then we go to the RTL evaluation uh, implementation stage. That's why we design Pensive. And the goal is really to provide a modeling principle that computer architects who design the processor and the security mechanism can directly use to describe their ideas. And still, it's rigorous enough for this uh, model to be verified by these automated reasoning tools, techniques. So in order to design a technique, just take a look how computer architects come up with defense mechanisms. Usually, we view our processors as, um, as a design composed hierarchically using different modules. For example, in the out-of-order processor, we have a fetch module to fetch instructions from the memory to the processor, take instructions from the memory. And then with this encoding of instruction, we are trying to figure out, OK, what this instruction is. So we do decode, and the rename is more an advanced feature to track data dependencies across instructions. And then when we try to do dispatch, dispatch, which is, OK, I figure out whether there's available units, functional units in the processor, so I can schedule send instruction to be executed. And the, some instructions may need to access memory, such as load and stores. And the, when the instruction finished, we do commit. And we usually do not have a monolithic design. We usually have each module uh, connected. And sometimes you can substitute these modules. And when we design defense mechanisms, we usually take a module out. And we modify it to apply some of our mitigations. For example, in terms of mitigating spectre and meltdown, we can delay speculative loads until 
it is, uh, we know it's not a misspeculation. And then we plug in this module back into our whole system. In addition to that, meanwhile, the other teams in the, uh, in the design team may try to optimize the other modules for better performance. For example, you can take the fetch module and plug in a more advanced branch predictor so that your process can become more performant, et cetera. So different teams work on different modules. So, so in summary, what do we actually need the modeling technique to become, uh, to be is that first thing to be modular, quite obvious here. Second, we need to be able to precisely describe the timing behavior in each module, because usually the defense mechanisms involve changing the timing of the module. And finally, we want to represent a space of designs rather than a single design point. Uh, as we mentioned that we want our defense mechanisms work towards all possible branch predictors rather than a single type of branch predictor, because a branch predictor is very likely to be changed by other teams. So following this spirit, we put together this modeling technique, Pensive, and it only contains two uh, important techniques. The first technique is that we are trying to decouple timing and functionality using the handshaking interface. Handshaking interface is very commonly see, uh, seen in the RTL, low RTL, register level, trans uh, register trans level transfer uh, code, where two modules try to talk to each other. So let's take an example, look at example. So if we are looking at a memory system, the interface the memory system have with the outside world is that it asks the external world, world to provide an address, and then the memory will return the data residing in that address. So that is the interface you always have, no matter how performant your memory system is. Your memory system may be very slow, takes hundreds of cycles to respond, or your memory system may have a cache inside. So sometimes if you hit the cache, you get response much faster. But no matter how fast your response is, the functional interface is address and data. So we have something to play with. And then we plug in the handshaking signal, which is a valid ready signal for each interface. So for example, for the input, we will get the valid signal from the external world because that is the indication, okay, I'm giving you a new input. And the input ready signal means that whether my memory system is going to take on another request or not. That is to model the back pressure you may have. So sometimes your memory system can take multiple, uh, simulta uh, multiple requests simultaneously, but then when the queue or something's being filled up, it, can it cannot take more requests. So the ready signal will simulate the back pressure. We do similar things for the output interface. And one important thing is that no matter how your memory system is with all the variations, the functional interface will be kept the same, but you can specify different behaviors for your timing signals. And we connect the functional signal to a function submodule and the timing signal to a timing submodule. And this just put, into a, put it into a structure, a template for us to play with our second technique that is, we call an uninterpreted function. So uninterpreted function is a very classic technique people use uh, in formal methods and programming language to abstract the details away when you are not wanting to reason about details. Basically, an uninterpreted function can be used to represent a space of functions with the same input and output types. Let me give you an example. So here I say an uh, uninterpreted function that takes two Boolean input and generate one Boolean output. Visually, we can represent the function body, unspecified function body as a cloud, so that this uninterpreted function can represent arbitrary uh, binary operators, such as AND or XOR, you name it. That is the power of it. And the benefit, we are using uninterpreted function particularly inside a timing, side, a timing module. So we connect the input and output valid signals and ready signals inside the timing module and connect them to uninterpreted functions. That gives us the capability to represent a space of designs without reasoning about details. So following the memory example, we can say the memory request latency is an uninterpreted function of the history of the input signal and the addresses it's associated with. With this, 
very simple, just a single line of code, we are able to represent uh, memory hierarchies with arbitrary level of caches, arbitrary, brand, uh, arbitrary cache replace policies, associativity, et cetera, and maybe even some address-based optimization such as prefetchers. And this allow us to use simple method to cover a space of microarchitecture designs with complex uh, timing behaviors. And with this modeling technique, we are able to ask computer architects, the designer, to formulate design in this model. And then we take this model and take a formally specified security property and give it to a model checker, which is you know, kind of standard tools. And a model checker is, people call it like a push button technique. So we're really trying to remove the formal method expertise requirement from the designer. And then model checker will tell you whether uh, the system is not secure, so it generates an attack example for you, or it said it is a bounded model checking, so it said, okay, it can, can be secure for k number of cycles. Of course, it's not a proof, but it takes us one step uh, into the uh, domain of like, at least we can automatically reasoning security within a couple of number of cycles. And uh, very excitedly, uh, excitingly, uh, we show that such a tool can actually be used to reason about security of the latest design. So we indeed find an unknown security vulnerabilities in Ghost Minion. If you still remember, that is kind of the defense mechanism uh, popped up in the slide where I have the timeline, I talk about the cache and cat and mouse games. So I would not bother with you about uh, how the counter examples we can find. Just want to wrap, okay, just want to wrap up that, you know, Hardware design is a very lengthy, complex procedure, starting from a hardware design idea uh, in, and with a chip. There is a very, very complex design procedures involved. So we are working more, exploring more possibilities to integrate between uh, integrate ideas and technologies from the programming language and the formal methods world to make our secure design, uh, you know, trustworthy. Uh, not fully trusted yet. And uh, the past work, Pensive, focuses on high-level abstract hardware models because we focus on the early stage of a design. And we are also looking to how to integrate idea, extend idea to other stages of design, including oh, you know, high-level hardware discrete language or even RTL level. So that kind of wrap up my technical part of the talk. But I, in the remaining time, I just want to mention that uh, I mentioned this hardware security design course at MIT. So we developed this course uh, four or five, uh, three, or five, three or four years ago, and now it's really wrapped up as a real course with, uh, with a relatively good enrollment. And in, uh, one highlight of this course is that we ask the students to get a real experience to experiment, experimenting the latest state-of-the-art attacks on, on processors. We are not using simulators, rather we are asking, we are teaching students to understand how these attacks work on commercial processors, and then also use the knowledge they have learned to understand how we should mitigate it and understand the trade-offs in designing uh, mitigations uh, in terms of like performance, security, and energy efficiency. They all need to be put together when you are really designing mitigations. Uh, so thanks a lot. This wraps up my talk.